Our four CEUs in a beer program started about, I think, five or six years ago as a way to provide a lot of um, education points um, CEUs um, in one sitting, but also to offer te more technical topics and uh, content. And so um, we're very happy to have had such wonderful topics in the past, um, from soils to accessible play to trees, um, and finally here to stormwater today. Um, today, um, our session is both for uh, landscape architecture credits as well as ISA credits for certified arborist. Um, also something that's uh, new for our chapter, um, being able to provide um, arborist credits as well. So speaking of CEUs, if you need CEUs, please make sure you check in at the, uh, the front desk around the corner to um, sign in. Um, you'll also need to have a uh, registration form um, with uh, a survey to uh, submit back um, to get your uh, certificate of credits. Um, also, I'd like to mention, um, uh, as a representative of the American Society of Landscape Architects, um, we ha offer many events throughout the year, um, some for CEU credits, some for networking, some for social events. Um, so our next um, great event is our holiday party, which is on December 6th. Um, it's from 6.30 to 9.30 at Francis Tavern downtown. Please go to aslany.org to register for that. And also, coming up real soon, faster than we ever expected, um, our uh, awards um, submissions will open up in January and be uh, due on January 31st. So if you've been working on some fabulous projects throughout the year, which I know everyone has been, um, it's time to start thinking about putting together your awards applications. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here and introduce, um, I'm sorry, Nelson from Trees, New York. Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nelson and I'm the executive director of Trees, New York. Since 1976, Trees New York has been training and mobilizing volunteers to care for New York City's tree trees. We're the only institution designated to train and license volunteers as citizen pruners. I know I was chatting with a few citizen pruners earlier, so how many citizen pruners we have in the room? All right, excellent, I like that. Thank you, thank you for being part of the team. And for everyone else, we're gonna get you signed up for uh, next spring, so. Um, so for the past three years, Trees New York has made a concerted effort to steward tree trees near New York City's waterways. And um, with the help of our citizen pruners and volunteers, we've stewarded and pruned over 850 trees near the Newtown Creek, which is an EPA Superfund site. And the New York City Parks Department's tree tree map estimates that the total number of gallons intercepted, um, st uh, stormwater gallons intercepted by the trees we care for just this year alone is over 850,000 gallons, which has a total economic, thank you, which has a total economic value of about $61,000. So that's pretty amazing. And our goal for 2018 is to triple these metrics citywide. Um, we're also proud to have partnered with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, one of our co-hosts today. And in partnership with the Conservancy, we created an introduction to Bioswells course. And we taught this course to our citizen pruners, community groups, students, and we recently just taught it as part of an environmental justice course with John Jay College. Um, we work with students throughout the five boroughs, introducing them to urban forestry and environmental issues such as stormwater management, combined sewage overflow, invasive insects, uh, urban heat island effect, and we also get them out of the classroom and connect them with their urban environment and so they can get the opportunity to store trees near their school and after school site. Every summer, we also hire a group of high school students and give them their first summer job in urban and community forestry. It's a paid seven-week internship. And we also get the students out on the waterways so they can learn about riparian tree plantings and maintenance, uh, water quality, and also bioindicators. They look at various bioindicators. Um, it's a great program, we're really proud of that. And uh, with us today are two Trees New York staff members as well. Uh, Sam Bishop, our Director of Education. Sam, 
Wave to the crowd. He's our staff arborist. <laughs> Ashley Pettis, who is our um, environmental educator and also the lead instructor of our Young Urban Forester internship. I'm really excited about today's panel. Um, it's going to be great. Um, and as practitioners, designers, and policymakers, all of New York City is counting on us to make sure that New York City's urban forest is sound and resilient. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to pass things off to Alki, Trees New York board member and uh, senior vice president of Deep Root Infrastructure, who is also the sponsor of today's event. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to see all you guys here, all this enthusiasm for trees and stormwater together. Uh, I'm, you know my bias. I am very definitely a tree guy, so all the rest of green infrastructure discussed today you can just ignore. Um, but I will say that um, this is a, in my opinion, some old friends and new friends, but all are a really blue ribbon panel of stormwater experts within their own fields. Um, some new friends, some old friends. And, uh, but all of them from private, part, uh, private sector, public sector, academia, it's really going to be an interesting uh, day. Uh, I will just like to assure you that all these guys went to really good colleges. And with that, I will like to introduce Bill Hunt, probably the nation, nation's leading researcher when it comes to green infrastructure in the, in the city, so, or whatever, green infrastructure. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my first gig in New York. Then I can say the leading research, well, I really can't even then, but in the city. That'd be great to do research here. Uh, I take it the next talk is boom, me. All right. It's a pleasure to be here. And this is actually the second time I've been in this room to give a talk. I was here several years ago in the summer to give a talk on permeable pavement. And so it's kind of fun to be able to talk about actually green, even more green, what looks to be greener stuff than just permeable pavement. And uh, I'm really glad you had me go first for lots of different reasons, and one of which is I think I'm be able to provide a bit of an overview for some of the other speakers to, to follow upon. And you'll see pictures throughout of, of my progeny, uh, the next generation of, of people who are ca take care of our world. I want to talk about, uh, start off with ecosystems. And how many of y'all have enjoyed an ecosystem lately? <laughs> That's good. This is a great group. You know, I talked to engineers. How many engineers are in the room? Like, they're all in the back. I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> I'm an engineer, uh, yeah. But I had to sit towards, no, actually, I sent it back too. But um, yeah, when I talk about a bunch of engineers, like ecosystems, I thought we were here for an engineering talk, right? But they, they, they do relate, and we have wonderful ecosystems, mountain ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, and, that, and you can relate to this. This is, this is taken actually pretty far from here, but you have ecosystems like this not too far from New York City. And then, and then this is the classic sort of suburban ecosystem, the backyard stream. And all of these things are providing value, one of which is the places where children can play, but there's even more value that they provide. And I also like to mention that even parking lots have the possibility. Oh, yeah, it's working. That's right. That's our ecosystem of sorts. I'm that parent. You probably wonder about those guys that are out there that let the kids walk, you know, by themselves on the street. I had a woman, no lie, threaten to call child protective, whatever they call those things, because I was letting my kids play in the creek, which, by the way, had no flowing water in it, letting my kids play in the creek. And she's like, you can't let, I said, what do you mean you can't do that? And she says, your daughter, who happened to be four, was crossing a tree by herself. I was like, yeah, she's good at that. But, you know? And it's an issue I think we do have to deal with now as people get more and more protective. But we need to get in touch with, uh, with nature. And in urban nature, boom, talk about the, sh the trees of New York. Where did he go? There he is. Yeah, that's right. She's in New York. Urban nature is a huge part of nature, all right? And so when we try to put st we treat stormwater practices, we are often creating little ecosystems, all right? And some of them are going to be you know, more diverse than others, but we are creating little ecosystems that actually are treating stormwater runoff. You can see some of, them, some of them there, which is then I introduce this concept that most engineers have never heard of as the concept, of, but I know y'all have, because most of you are not engineers, um, the concept of ecosystem services. And, and in a place like North Carolina, where the politics have changed a lot, or at least those that are elected are different, um, it's really important to relate what we do back to people. You know, you can no longer really do things just to save the shrimp. 
it'd be nice. It's not about oysters anymore. It's about the people that eat the oysters. Now that matters. And so I like to talk about ecosystem services because they are the services that our big ecosystems and little ones are providing people. And there's a whole bunch of them out there, some of which are pretty well understood. And I'm going to get into some of those, of course. And then there's some that we as stormwater designers, at least as engineers, never even think about a la like food provision, which I'll get into eventually as well. And what registers with people is when I can say, look, all of these ecosystem services that are being provided have value. All right, now some of it is not quantified like it needs to be. And when people ask me where I think the world, the stormwater world, the green infrastructure world is going, I think a big part is going to be actually quantifying how, quantifying the goods or the provisions that are, that are given to us by ecosystems. Now when we design green infrastructure, we design it for that first bullet. A designer, a landscape architect, an engineer will get in usually and they say, okay, the regulations are making me worry about cleaning the water and improving its hydrology. All right, I can say both of those things. I know it registers here in New York, but while we are designing the systems for those two base ecosystem services, designing our SEMs or green infrastructure for those two base ecosystem services, there's a lot of other stuff that either is or could be going on. And one of the interesting things we have to start thinking about as we do designs may be how can I design my system to be better at sequestering carbon? How can I design my system such that I provide more air quality protection? All right. And so the title of my talk did deal with research of, of, infra, of uh, ecosystem services and as they relate to green infrastructure. And in general, that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be. All right. So I'm going to start with the basics. These are the things that when we design a stormwater control measure or a part of ecosystem or, or, or part of green infrastructure, we are, this is, this is front and center of what we have to do. Mitigate floods and help control uh, erosion, all right? And this is a classic case. What do you think happened here? Now, this doesn't happen in New York City, I don't think that much because you've, you know, you've hardened it, all right? A good chunk of the city's hardened. But you go in the suburbs, you find this. What's, what's, what do you think that person had to do? who lived in that house? The answer is move, all right? Now, and that is a crime that is perpetrated by we stormwater designers. Absolutely is. Either because we did not stand up and require some sort of treatment to go in, or we actually picked the wrong practices and put them in because while it mitigated peak flows from a 10-year storm or a two-year storm, it didn't do much to help, or actually did not even did much to help, it actually exacerbated the issue associated with stream bank erosion. And so we want to look at things that will help minimize this and minimize flooding, which brings us to a really cool project that we were involved in in Raleigh, North Carolina, I don't know, five, six years ago. And this developer comes in, where you see that red polygon, the developer comes in, it was all woods. It was the city of Raleigh, city council, says, I want to develop this site. Well, there aren't a whole bunch of woods patches anymore in Raleigh. We're the second or third fastest growing city in the United States. How many of y'all have been to the Triangle? Well, thank you. Come back. I hope you liked it. It's a good time to come now. It's basketball season. And that matters, that matters where I'm from. And, and even our football team is good this year. This, this year. It's good. Okay. So the city council's like, we don't, you know, there's not a lot of grass patches. I don't think we want you to develop here. And I said, oh, man. And then he says, well, is there anything I can do? I'm going to come back to this slide in a second. And they said, well, yeah. If you promise that you will meet natural hydrologic conditions post-development, we'll let you build there. Now, and really what that translated to was there was a maximum amount of runoff that they were going to allow to be discharged from the site. Anyone want to bet, guess, cumulative, like over the course of a year, how much runoff we're talking about was allowed, would be allowed to be discharged from that development in a percent, like 50%, 30%, what do you think? Someone give me a number. 90%. 90% runoff. You think, or you think, so the answer is no. It's not 90. It's not. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said something. Um, that's great. Anyone else, no one's going to answer anything now like, mm -mm. No, mm -mm. what do you think? 10? That's where I thought she was going, to be honest with you. Honestly, 10%, so 10% cumulative, that's close. 
And that, you were thinking 90% infiltration of alpha-transpiration, weren't you? Yes, I knew that. 10% is awfully close. It's actually 5. It's 5%. And so this is one of those things where, as an engineer, I'm, and I'm like, okay. It's a challenge, right? And the developer could have said what? Could have said, forget it. I'm not going to do that. But instead, the developer said, that land's pretty valuable. <laughs> We're going to try a way to make this work. And, and so they did. And I'm going to show you what they did in a second, but I also want to point out something very important, that underneath the red polygon, there's a blue one. And that blue one is a conventional design where we had a parking lot, we had a building, and we had a swale and a dry detention facility. And what we did is we got to monitor, oh, and by the way, not only did they promise to deliver this, but they also had to agree to let NC State come in and monitor it to prove that they hit it. Talk about the pucker factor. Yeah, that's exactly what was going on there. And so this is what they did to make it green or to make it a low impact development or green infrastructure. They had their requisite green on the surface, looks green when you look at it, infrastructure, bioretention with some swales. They also had a big uh, rainwater harvesting system that everyone could see. They had an even bigger underground rainwater harvesting system that was used to flush the toilets. It was a Whole Foods that was going in. And then, very importantly, this massive underground detention tank with a big infiltration gallery, all right? And this is what they put in. They threw a lot of money at it. Remember, they chose to do it. They could have walked. The economics could have dictated, like, hey, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to invest. And so they chose to make that investment. And this is how well everything worked. Remember I showed you the blue polygon across the street? Well, the runoff coefficient is a very slick little engineering or, or metric, not just engineers use it, that says, of all the rainfall drops that fall onto my landscape and hardscape, how much of them run off? How much of them leave by, by storm drain network? It's, it's that. And so it's a pretty simple thing. Cumulatively, one out of every two drops that fell on the conventional configuration found its way out, which, by the way, was pretty much in line with a bunch of other studies that have been conducted on the East Coast. All those studies are East Coast studies. In fact, any of y'all are from Connecticut. The hood at all is from Connecticut, okay? And then the LID site that we had, you can see it did really well. Like two drops out of 100 were finding their way off the site. Pretty awesome stuff. And remember, what was our target? Five. So they beat it. So some of you were like, dude, how did you beat nature? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Nature does not have like six feet of driving head on it. And that's precisely what you get when you have a big infiltration gallery with a massive tank that's pushing water through it, right? And so there are times when, when topography allows, all right, you can actually do better. Uh, and obviously, the guys who designed this wanted to make sure that when our study was done that they met the 5% targets, they kind of built, all right, because they, they want to be able to develop again, which they, which they have. They've, been, they've lived to see another development day. So that was great news. Now, I'm not going to spend hardly any time on this, not because I don't love this, because Al, I do, but the next speaker is just going to wax eloquently on stormwater treating street trees. So there you go. There you go. All right, you're going to get all that in detail later, all right? I teased them. That's a tease. Okay, now, a technology that y'all started, and by the way, y'all is you plural. Everyone with me there? You guys up top there? There's, are there seats up there? Do you like standing? It's got a great view, right? I mean, look at that dude with the hat on. No, I want those shades. Okay, blue roofs. Y'all started blue roofs. Did you know that? That's a new, at least the coining of the term, all right, and the general promotion of it. It's a New York City thing. I have some pictures from uh, I, one picture, which one of those pictures is from, NC, oh, yeah, this one there is from, from DEP here in the city, okay? Well, we studied those. I'm like, that's a great idea. They're doing it in New York. We should try it in North Carolina. And so we, that's a North Carolina version. Here's the New York version. It's big. It's massive. North Carolina's little dainty little blue roofs and green roofs. And what we did is we looked at blue roofs, green roofs, and control roofs to see how much hydrologic mitigation we get. And you can see... What you, I mean, research, like, you're like, dude, green research does not look that hard. We could build that, right? I like to think it's a little harder than what I'm portraying, but maybe it isn't that hard, right? And so we have our, we have our trays, and we happen to fill it with a local, locally sourced media. 
and we designed it to basically function like we thought it would, like a green roof would, to see if a blue roof could provide comparable hydrologic benefit to green roofs, because green roofs are de very much beloved across the United States and, and, and the developed world. So you get a little close-up of both of them. And this is what we found. Now, this is one of the things about blue roofs, green roofs, and control roofs is it's really hard to pick the colors on charts. That's a joke. It's actually very easy. The gray is the control roof. The blue is, ready for this? The blue roof. And the green is, yes, you got it, the green roof. And you can see this is the amount of runoff that is either retained or discharged, or however, whether you're glass half full or glass half empty person. And you can see that the blue roof and the green roof, number one, worked about the same. And two, cut the amount of discharge by about 50%. That's pretty good. Now, I'm going to come back in a little bit. Oh, I also mentioned that both systems were able to have some impact, not a shocking impact, but some impact on larger storm peak flow mitigation. Okay, some impact. Now, I'm going to come back in a little bit to talk about the water quality aspects of it, but do understand that these ultra-urban practices, which I think everyone would consider blue if to be, really does work. Um, and, 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 and you can actually start projecting how well it worked based upon the design. So I'm going to go to the next step. Next step is going to be nutrients. Not everyone in the world is worried about nutrients. Everyone's worried about flooding. Everyone worries about uh, property loss. Nutrients is the next step up. We worry a lot about nutrients. And uh, I'm going to introduce one of, I think, the coolest practice there is. By the way, Al, you can put trees in these things. All right? This has a few trees. Uh, constructed stormwater wetlands. And, and I like to tell people that you have constructed wetlands and pond wetland fringes in, in, New, in New York City. People are like, really? It's either on Staten Island. But they're there. They're cool. All right? And so we studied these human-built stormwater wetlands. And the idea is, is when we build a, an ecosystem like that that treats stormwater, we appeal to the naturally occurring ecosystem for inspiration. And so what do you think the naturally occurring ecosystem is for a constructed stormwater wetland? It would be a wetland, right? You got it. It would be a wetland. And so then you have this sort of moment of truth. I say we're putting all these dots, except for ref, all these dots are uh, stormwater constructed wetlands that we had built in North Carolina. And that ref was a naturally occurring wetland in a coastal setting of North Carolina. And we were able to take a look at all the concentrations that were being discharged from both, right? And so as a designer, you're like, mm, this is your pucker moment. As a researcher, we've been planning and designing and, and promoting the use of, of stormwater wetlands. And now we're like, all right, well, how do they really compare to the thing that they're based on, they're modeled on? And there you go. All those plus signs, that's what's from the naturally occurring wetland. And all those other symbols, well, those are from constructed stormwater wetlands. And we're going to talk about the one oddball in a second. But take a look at the median organic nitrogen concentration leaving both is about the same. In fact, I gave this, not this talk, but I gave a, a semblance of this talk yesterday to uh, a bunch of high schoolers, which, by the way, is very rewarding. Um, and I'm like, what do you, well, how would you all characterize that? And they're like, they're kind of the same-ish. I'm like, yeah, that's good. I'm with that. They're kind of the same-ish. Except for, oh, all right, well, you can tell which one it is. It's the one that, the one that I think is the sh sign in Russian. I think that is right. I don't know. I don't think I'll speak Russian or anything like that, but I think that's right. That, 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 that X with the extra line in it symbol. And that obviously doesn't, doesn't match the other ones, right? Not at all. So your question is, what's wrong, Bill? What's going on? And the answer is, that wetland was undersized by about a factor of five. All right? Which then gets to this point that you actually do need to design them. These things just can't be just, oh, it looks good, let's put it up. I mean, you, you actually need to use some numbers and design them to make sure that you, that you don't have that symbol going on, all right? So they do actually have to be some size. And therefore, really what you're, what you're seeing here is that the system wasn't able to process the water as much as, as we'd like for it to have happened. And by the way, I should also point out, it's not the same. It's just close, which I think seems right, right? We're building a system modeled on nature, but we are, it's still a human-created system with, with some significant differences from a hydrologic standpoint. All right, now let's go back to blues and green roofs. 
because I just don't want to leave them since I'm here in New York City. And I'm going to show you now the nitrogen load associated with blue roofs, green roofs, and control roofs. And you all can see that green dash thing. That's the nitrogen load that's being discharged from the green roof. That would qualify as not that good. All right. And then you'll see that blue and then the gray dash line, they're about the same. That's the nitrogen loads being discharged from the blue roof and the control roof. And that, folks, is pretty good. All right. So another argument, I think I have something for phosphorus. There's phosphorus. In fact, the phosphorus story is even worse all right, in terms of the, di the disparity between green roofs and blue roofs. But in places where, and I know you guys may not be worried about this, not all of you. Meredith, you are. You're worried about nitrogen and phosphorus. Brian, you are. Blue roofs have this inherent advantage in that they're not chock full of compost that's there to get the plants to grow. They're just rocks. All right, I say rocks, they're kind of fancy rocks, fancy aggregate. Um, but they work great from a nutrient standpoint. And then they work just as well if you design them right from a hydrologic standpoint. I'm thinking, hmm. Look, green roofs have their place. They're, they're more attractive than blue roofs, absolutely. They, they look nicer. They probably will help you sell property better. But if you're putting a, one of these two treatments on a roof and no one's really looking on it or you don't really care about the view and you're not trying to save money you know, for insulation or whatever, I don't know, blue roof might be the way to go. That's why I do research. Okay, let me see all the millennials in the room. Show by hand. Don't be afraid, that's cool. Do you know what's going on here? Like crap, I raised my hand, you told me not to be afraid. Do you know what's going on? That's right, it's when the river caught on fire. This is LeBron James's hometown. Ryan Winston does a lot of work down there. That was 1969, now it seems like a long time ago, but it was only three years before I was born. And, and I don't think of myself as old. I think of myself totally as middle-aged. <laughs> How many of you, when you cross that middle-aged threshold, are like, crap, I'm middle-aged now? Anybody? Thank you for being honest. I'm like, crap, I am middle-aged now. I've got to attend faculty meetings. I can't use, like, I've got to do research as an excuse. I've got to go to faculty meetings now. Any of y'all have to go to faculty meetings? Are they awful for you as they are for me? All right. Anyway, this was a river that caught on fire, and we talk about wins and losses. This is a big loss, really. We talk about disasters. You know, aviation has, like, the Hindenburg as a disaster. Civil engineering has the Galloping Gertie as a disaster. We environmental ecological engineers have that to thank as our, as our prototype disaster. Like, a river caught on fire. That's bad, right? So anyway, that was 1969. Three years later, the Clean Water Act was passed by Congress. And interestingly, I'd always said and signed into law by President Nixon, but he actually did not sign it into law. Did you know that? They overrode a veto. That I did not know. Now I do. And so let's talk about some of the nasties. Pathogens. How many, are you all from Canada? Like nothing, that's good. I, it's a beautiful place. So your geese don't stay up there anymore. <laughs> Like they heard about the low tax rates in the South. And they kind of hang out and defecate everywhere. This is what we think of America. <laughs> anyway, it really, pardon the pun, craps up our water. And so we're looking for passive systems that can take pathogens and their indicator species out. And oh, by the way, if, they, if you have pathogens, maybe not due to Canada geese, but you know, anything in, along a beach, and by the way, where do you think the kids are going to play? Are they going to play in the ocean? Are they going to play in the storm water? Yeah, as big and as proud the ocean is, kids like storm water. I've watched them live. I'm like, there's an ocean there, but no, why? Yeah, play in the water. It's really great. It's full of pollution, kids. And you have to put signs up. We have a beach in North Carolina that used to be every time it rained, they put the signs, don't swim within 200 feet. And I don't know if people even know what that means, you know, of this sign, or you could get sick. Anyway, we worry about pathogens for obvious reasons. And so here we go. We have a little bioretention cell in or a passive treatment device. I say little. It's, like, for New York City, this would probably be considered pretty big. And this is where research really gets complicated. I want you all to compare the blue diamonds to the green squares. How many of you like Lucky Charms as children? <laughs> this is it. This is like the Lucky Charms chart. And the green squares are lower than the blue diamonds. That tells you, in general they are, that tells you that this pathogen indicator species is essentially being removed most of the time by this device. 
So again, your green infrastructure is doing essentially what it was designed to do. And then I've got a good buddy at the University of Maryland, Dr. Alan Davis. He allows me to use these next two slides because they tell a great story. Another bioretention cell, another form of green infrastructure. See these big pl pie plots, pie charts. The green part of them is all the metal that came in that got trapped in the soil. The little magenta color, that's pink and red for the guys who don't know their colors, which is most guys. That is the amount that got stored in plants. And then the blue pie wedge, well, that's what actually left. And so you can see a few things. Number one, almost all of the, all of the metals were actually captured by the bioretention cell, which is fantastic, OK? Uh, and number two, most of it stayed in the soil, which is good. But then you start worrying about, oh, man, toxic waste sites. Right? Are we creating toxic waste sites? So we looked at that, and we're like, we're going to find that out. So we happen to have this project that I showed you a little bit just like three slides ago for, bi for the bioretention uh, on pathogens that we went back. We wanted to see if we had zinc and copper counts that had gotten to the point after 11 years that we have zinc and copper counts that were getting to the point of being sort of toxic, right? Because people want to know. And this is what we did. We, you can see a, an engineered, a style, we'll call it a stylized version of the practice, I highlight the four bay where the water would come in, fill the four bay, and then go visit the balance of the site. All right? And those grids are important because I'm about to show you something called heat maps. How many of y'all know about heat maps? Now, the next time someone asks, which might be tomorrow, you can all raise your hand. Oh, shoot. Darn it. Hold on. I cannot believe I talk about a heat map and then don't show it to you. Oh, my God. This is one of those... Okay, here it goes. We're just going to unhide this. Can y'all see that? Okay, we're going to go with that. I might need help because this is not the type of computer I'm used to. That, blo that black square, that's where the four bay is. That's where the water first comes in. Everything else is the balance of the cell. And the zinc and the uh, copper are the top two squares. So what do you observe? That almost all of the cell after 11 years, no problem. I mean, the four bays got problems, but you know what you're supposed to do with four bays? You're supposed to clean them out anyway. And I will also point out that they had not hit the point of being toxic yet in terms of disposal. Now, let's see if I can figure out a way to get this thing back started. And I might need someone that know. Oh, wait, here it is. Slideshow. God bless you. Play from current slide. Thank you. A lot. You know, just you being here made me comfortable. You know, like sometimes you're going to panic, but like I got help right here if I mess this up. Okay. All right. And so people are like, well, how, how big a problem is? Well, it's, I'm not one to always like pass problems down to, to, to you know, posterity, but this is one of the ones I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. 300 to 1,000 years plus of storage capacity before it becomes, this stuff becomes toxic. Like, you know. In 300 years, they're going to have like a little ray gun that they can zap and pff, oh, no more zinc. I'm like, dude, we're in good shape on this one. So everything I've talked about, how much time do I have, Al? Am I doing all right? Seriously? Just 12? God. All right. Of course, I'm wasting time with that little maneuver. Why do we stop there? They reduce runoff. Mm-hmm. They help protect downstream waters. They take pollutants out. But for some reason, we like to stop there. Like, OK, our job is done. It's not. And um, I'm going to talk right up front about how, ready for this one, how your stormwater control measures, your green infrastructure, can actually help mitigate to some small, some appreciable, but appreciable way, climate change. I'll let you guess the president that it issued this executive order, right? It was 2009. I just gave the answer away. I know half of you are wrong. Like, oh, God, I got it wrong. Yeah, you didn't. This is the first time that greenhouse gas emissions and stormwater management had been mentioned in the same, probably ever, in the, in the, in the same uh, paragraph. And it basically said the federal agencies, hey, look, we want you guys to think, start thinking about your, how, you, how you impact climate change, all right? And so I went to our DOT because our Department of Transportation, they manage a lot of roads in rural North Carolina. And this has application in the city, so you'll see where I'm going in a second. And these are some of the practices that our DOT employs in rural North Carolina. I said, you know what, guys? The president, and they've said that you need to start worrying about 
greenhouse gas emission. And listen, so that means we can start working, worrying about carbon sequestration. And I bet that your standard cross-section is sequestering carbon. Now, you can try to use some data that's out of Kansas for a cornfield to estimate it, or you can hire us, your land-grant school, to estimate it for you. And I'm going to skip through that. And, and they did. And there it is. There is a rate of carbon sequestration for filter strips along the sides of roads. And then we said, hey, look, why don't we compare that standard design that you know some, some people like, because I guess they can mow it, but let's compare it to that wetlandy, that swale that became a wetland because of neglect, usually, uh, and see if there's any difference in carbon sequestration there. I guess the answer to that one is, oh yeah, buddy. So then the DOT was like, interesting. How hard is it to make our standard swales into wetland swales? And so they actually came back and started funding us to look at different check dam design configurations to try to make the systems wetter so that the standard swales could become more like wetland swales in part, not exclusively, but in part because they wanted to bolster their carbon sequestration numbers. Now, y'all, that happened in the South. <laughs> now think about it, that's a big deal. They, may, they were making decisions based on carbon sequestration. And look, they're not even allowed to talk about that per our state legislature, and they're still doing it. You gotta love people that are rebels. Okay, and now we'll keep going because I believe this is gonna be something that happens in the not terribly distant future. It might be four years from now, three years from now. But you can actually calculate the carbon footprint of stormwater control measures. You can, you can figure out if a stormwater control measure is carbon neutral. And, and by the way, I'm gonna let you know one of the best ways to get your, carb, your SCM carbon neutral, ready for this, Al, it's gonna make you very happy, ready? is to include trees. If you really want to do it, that's how you do it. He smiled. For those of you in the back, up in the balcony, he was smiling. And essentially, the way that the conceptual model works is pretty basic. You have the carbon associated with the stuff that you use, all right? You've got the carbon associated with building it. You've got the carbon. These are all on the negative. These are all the, well, or adding carbon. And then you have to associate with maintenance. And then the one thing you got, the one way, the one thing that can drive your practice to be carbon neutral is your vegetation, is your vegetation. And you can actually start comparing practices that employ vegetation to those that don't employ vegetation to start looking at their carbon footprint. And then how you manage that vegetation really matters. And the type of vegetation that you use matters, all right? Now, what I showed you here was if you were designing systems in North Carolina per our design and following our maintenance regimen, these are the practices that, uh, this is the carbon sequestration performance of those practices. And what I don't show you is that swales are actually less than zero. And I should also point out that levels per filter strip, that uh, the, the blue dash one is also eventually goes below zero. That is a, a miss. I need to fix that graph and I haven't. And the one that is below here is the, is the storm or the wetland. How to make a bioretention cell a little, how to make the bioretention cell a carbon sequester or more is to put more trees in it. And then there's just a model out there. I'll just blow it. But there is a model out there for anyone that might be interested. I will tell you, the guy who has the model is a buddy of mine, so I'm kind of just understand that. But there's a model out there that will help you predict the, uh, car the carbon footprint for stormwater control measures. That is where we're going. And I think New York City is one of the places. Heat Island, something you all care about. I'm going to show you two slides. Here's slide number one. And here's slide number two. A group in, in Knoxville did a study on it, and they were like, you know, if you can locate more trees, and I want to say stormwater treat, you know, stormwater treating trees in your urban landscape, you have this opportunity, and particularly more places like Knoxville, of actually cooling the ambient air. And in fact, in the middle of the summer, they, the nighttime temperatures were four degrees cooler Fahrenheit, four degrees cooler. And, you know, for some people, like, four degrees of my air conditioning is on. But you know what? Not everybody has air conditioning. And think about the difference in your quality of sleep if you can drop your temperature in your dwelling four degrees by using trees that treat stormwater runoff. Ryan, next for you. Now let's talk about green streets. Because the goal of green streets is to bring people to the street. Now that's not a big issue in New York because people are on the street all the time. And you... And that's why everyone here, everyone here is very fit because you're always walking. I love it. You're lucky, all right? You're lucky in that. You're like, 
come talk to me at Hello KM in January when it's freezing. Okay, that's fine. But we want to bring people to the street. And then when you're bringing people to the street, thank you, you're also exposing them to particulate matter. Now, obviously, it isn't that bad. But a lot of people die due to particulate matter. And so there's a guy that we work with at the University of Surrey in the UK, and he spends a lot of time on it. And at his campus, he studied the role of vegetation. Remember, I'm thinking about making these things into silva cells or other forms of suspended pavement that Ryan's going to get into, OK, along the street. And he has it. And what he did is he has a street. He's got a footpath. And he's got essentially this edge-like thing. And he looked at the air quality that people were being exposed to. All right, So the wind can blow basically one of three ways, from the street to the people, from the people to the street, and then up and along the street. All right, And then he took measurements along the street without a tree, along the street in front of a tree, in the middle of a tree, which is really good if you're worried about monkeys, and then on the other side of the tree, protected by a tree, all right? And you're going to see now the amount of air quality particulate, I think it's PM10, but it may be PM2.5, that was being ex people were being exposed to. And the crossroad is that which blows from the road to the people, all right? And you can see a legitimate reduction, a legitimate protection of pedestrians when they are shielded from particulates by the vegetation. And that is both from the road, from the basically blowing away. In every case, in every case we've got, you see it's safer to be behind. Hopefully one day it will be stormwater treating street trees. Now, it is important to note that not every tree is the same. And I want to point out that in street canyons, and this is Checkpoint Charlie. Any of y'all interested? In that? I mean, I, that was a bucket list for me. I grew up. And the 80s were sort of my decade of formation. And, you know, 80s was the decade of the, I mean, it was a huge Cold War decade. And Checkpoint Charlie was a bucket list. And there it is today. They got a couple of dudes from Africa there that posed for shots. Needless to say, I paid them the money and had my shot made with them. And it's a street canyon. And the idea behind you have a, and this New York City, Manhattan is comprised of a bunch of street canyons. So you have a height of the street. The height of the building is greater than the width of the street. And what they found is that certain types of vegetative scenarios actually are not the best. And that when we start thinking about designing, meaning that depending upon how the vegetation is, you can actually get particulates bounce off the bottoms of the trees and actually impact people, which means that we need to start thinking about how we lay out our stormwater treating street trees because, and there are ways, by the way, there's one way that's not particularly good, and there's a bunch of ways that are very good that can protect people. We need to start thinking about ways that we can lay out our green infrastructure so that we protect people. Very cool. And trust me, design engineers are not thinking about exposing people to particulates. They're not, all right? But we can do more about that, and that, I think, is another future area of research. And there's a colleague at, at the University of Copenhagen who's doing some of that work right now. All right, a little bit about biodiversity. Biodiversity, five minutes. Six, all right. Wetlands, wet ponds, and ponds that have no wetland shelf. So a pond with a littoral shelf is essentially a pond with a little wetland ring. And I want you to compare the pond without a wetland ring and the pond with the wetland ring, and note that the pond with the wetland ring has more predators than ponds without wetland rings. Now, why is that important? What do you think these predators are? We're not talking about alligators, right? We're talking about insects. All right, and particularly, uh, we were actually worried, but frogs would count as a predator too. And what are they preying upon? You got it, I love it, mosquitoes. That's right. And so there, we now have ways of designing facilities based on mosquito control. Look, when I started my job 20 years ago, I, wasn't, I didn't realize I'd be designing stormwater infrastructure to work around mosquitoes. But now we do, and it's a very important thing. And by the way, it really does work. Other ecosystem services. Cultural services. Here's a really cool uh, practice in Singapore. If you have a chance to get there, it's awesome. It's called the Biotope. It's a massive filter system that the Singaporean government wants you to walk through and learn about. Here is a 17-acre a, a wetland in Wilmington, North Carolina. that has a path that you can walk. And then a beautiful one from the heart of the south, Atlanta, Georgia. Beautiful pond system that has a lot of educational features associated. And all of these things, this recreation 
that is a, an absolute benefit and it, uh, that we don't um, account for at least financially as much as I think we should. The uh, whole Seattle, the guys know about the C Street and the C Street, the long story short, and the C Street, you go from a big wide street to a skinny street. And, it, and, and even though the people who lived on that street did not like it at first, their property values went up. And you know what? They liked it now. <laughs> uh, the Montgomery Ward building in Baltimore, I don't have to skip the story. It's a great story, but the short version of the story is they turned it into a green roof, and because it was a green roof, they started selling their properties faster. In fact, the guy, the developer of this site made money faster than he thought because the occupancy of the offices that looked onto the green roof was at a much higher rate than that which he expected because he was basing it on a standard looking roof. All right. How many of y'all like soccer? Football, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. Well, in Sweden they like it and they turn their infiltration bases into soccer pitches. Something to think about, right? Other benefits, permeable payment, you can park on it, right? Rainwater harvesting, you can reduce potable uses if you want. Um, this is one from Santa Monica, California. They collect their, their runoff and they flush toilets with it. I'm like, dude, that means like peeing. I'm taking advantage of ecosystem services. I love it, all right? <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. We built a wetland in West North Carolina to treat stormwater runoff, to reduce pollutants, improve the hydrology. Come to visit the site many years later, and I meet the town uh, public works director who says, we love this thing. You know what people are using it for? I'm like, I have no idea. Wedding photos. I'm telling you, I never thought that. And in fact, from that wetland, we were able to pick that beautiful bouquet. And I, and I know for a fact that the women in my life love flowers, including that just doll of a person who just turned five. I, I swear we have a market in the stormwater world that we are sitting on and we're not acting upon. And that's one of the things that we're looking at now is taking some of these, these stormwater practices and actually turning them in to horticultural resources. A famous example from uh, Vancouver, California. Uh, geez, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. I was, I was way off, okay? It's, it's the, uh, they built a green roof on their hotel. They claim that they save $30,000 a year by, by providing the, their herbs and some vegetables from their own green roof. And that sounds fine and dandy, but here's the proof in the pudding, and it comes back to economics and capitalism. They open up a new hotel in Toronto, and they put a green roof on it for the same purpose. And who here really thinks they're going to throw good money after bad? I don't think so. Okay, so now to, to finish this off, there are a lot of things that our stormwater control measures do provide in addition to runoff mitigation from a hydrologic and a quality standpoint. And these things, in many cases, impact property values. I am an absolute believer that as we go forward and start actually accounting for the suite of benefits that we derive from our little ecosystems that we are building, that we will almost always, if you can take advantage and, 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 and factor in the economics of it, ready for this one, do the right thing going forward someday. We're not there yet. But as I show you some of these things and the fact that carbon markets are developing and, and developers are understanding that doing these attractive practices increase the value of their properties, the people or the folks, what, who benefits is us as people. And by the way, the environment's benefiting too. We focus on the people, increasing the benefits that they derive and the environment benefits as well. So I'm gonna close with one last just little exhortation to please go out and enjoy some of those great ecosystem services that you have even here in beautiful New York City. Thank you very much. Please uh, welcome Ryan Winston from OSU, Ohio State University, a researcher and uh, scientific researcher there. Yeah, so, all right, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here uh, today to speak to y'all. Um, so I'm, you might have gathered I'm also from the South. Um, I spent 10 years, actually, a better part of 10 years working for Bill. Um, and I'm now up at Ohio State uh, building my own research program up there um, around different aspects of stormwater management. I'm going to talk to y'all today um, about using suspended pavement and street trees uh, for stormwater treatment, which I think is, is an absolutely obvious solution um, and one that uh, can work quite well 
um, in the ultra-urban environment like what we have here in New York City. Um, so I'm going to start this talk with a, with a story. Um, and then I'm going to give you a bit of background on suspended pavement. And then we'll actually go through and look at a little bit of uh, construction of uh, one of the systems that we monitored, or two of the systems that we monitored. And then we'll look at a little bit of data and kind of compare the performance of these systems to standard bioretention, or what you might call bioswales here um, in New York City. All right. When does the beer come out? Is that soon? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I saw the four CEUs in beer. I was like, man, he promised me a beer. All right. OK. Um, so Bill and I and a number of other people have been doing a lot of work down in Wilmington, which is our coastal city, as you can see there, um, <clears throat> to look at green infrastructure. And um, the city of Wilmington have been a great partner. One of the things that we were working on with them was residential street retrofits, where we were looking at uh, applying things at a neighborhood, kind of block scale. Um, so things like bioretention, permeable pavement, you know, street trees, and the like. Um, and so John Page and, and I and Bill um, published a couple of articles a couple of years back um, on that work. Um, it was all funded by US EPA 319 funding. And while we were doing a lot of work down there, we um, came across Al and a, a couple other folks um, at Deep Root, and we cobbled together funding, as you often do in the research world, um, to do this type of work. But I just wanted to, um, to show this because I'm going to uh, talk about the watershed here that we're, we, were, um, we were working in. So it was in the Burnt Mill Creek watershed, which is just immediately east of, of downtown uh, Wilmington. It's a highly uh, dense, uh, not, not as dense as uh, New York City by any stretch, but dense for Wilmington standard, uh, built in the early 1900s. Um, and you can see uh, we're working in this area. And we were going to, we had part of this project, we had designed these intersection retrofits. Um, where we were uh, basically building bioswales around the, the corner at that intersection, as I'll show you in just a second. So um, you can see there's a school there on the intersection, so we're going to take this kind of standard intersection. Um, here's another, another shot of it from gray to green, right? So you can tell I'm an engineer. Do you think I drew that? <laughs> Answer to that question, folks, would be no. All right, my artistic skills are terrible. So we hired a landscape architect, thank you, landscape architects, to make a nice pretty picture to sell to the local community, right? Um, so we had bioretention cells um, on all four sides of the corners, um, and, and it was going to be a fantastic project. You'll note that I say was. Um, and we had we'd worked in um, ADA compliance on uh, all the street corners, and we'd wrapped the bioretention cells around the corners. Um, we'd worked in uh, bus turning radii, all sorts of different factors in the design. And so the designer, namely this guy, um, had completed 100% designs in cooperation with the City of Wilmington. So we worked with all different parts of the um, City of Wilmington, stormwater streets, um, and the like. Um, we we'd incorporated these bioretention bump outs, which was, was our goal as stormwater engineers. Uh, but we also included, uh, as part of a, a bicycle byway that was going from downtown to, to, the, to the beach. Um, so that was included in the design. As I mentioned earlier, ADA compliance, and then also line of sight and turning radii issues for the school buses that use this uh, intersection to get to the nearby middle school. Um, so we've done a lot of work, a lot of effort, and really gotten the cart before the horse, as you'll see in just a second. So we worked with um, our Ag and Resource Economics Department to pitch the design to local homeowners. Uh, we basically went around, dropped off flyers, sh showed the pretty pictures that I showed you a few slides ago of what was going to happen in the neighborhood. Um, and while we cared about what the public thought, it was all the work at the end of the day was going to be done in the right-of-way, right? So the city of Wilmington was kind of like, you know, we own the right-of-way. We're going to do the work, you know, kind of come hell or high water. Um, and then we met Miss Ann, and I'm, I'm going to use a pseudonym. Her name was not Ann. Um, I'm going to protect, um, protect this nice, well, yeah, I don't know if I want to use the word nice, but this, this lady. Um, so here's her, her house here, and her house is directly on the corner where these retrofits were planned. So we, of course, put a door knocker on her, um, on her uh, front porch, and we, uh, we got a call back. She was, she was very happy to call us back. Um, and so we set up a meeting with her at her house. Um, and so it was myself and a couple of other folks who went to her house to discuss the plans. And upon entering, the first person I shook hands with was her lawyer. And so I realized that this was not going to be the type of fun meeting that I expected it to be, you know, talking about green infrastructure, all the exciting things we're going to do at her corner, right? So her lawyer was the first person. Her city council representative was the second person that I shook hands with. And then her son, which I was really glad he was there because he translated all of the cuss words that I, I really, some of them I didn't even quite understand, to be honest with you. It was like southern cuss words that I didn't. I didn't quite get, folks, um, that she was, she, yeah, she was not a happy lady. Um, and so she was, she was very belligerent about the fact that this, this project did not need to happen in front of her house. She did not want these bioswales in front of her house. Um, and basically was primarily worried about losing the parking that she had owned this house since, I think, the 40s. Um, and she was primarily worried about losing the parking in front of her house. 
City of Wilmington has an ordinance that you're supposed to park 25 feet from the tangent of the curve of the intersection. That's not even 20, that's her car right there, that's not even 25 inches from the tangent of the curve of that intersection, right? And that's where she's been parking her car for the last 30, 40 years, right? And you're gonna all of a sudden tell this lady that she no longer has a parking spot out in front of her house. These, this particular neighborhood has no um, driveways and garages. So um, if you take a bird's eye view of Miss Ann's house, you might sort of uh, gather that she's the litigious type um, so this would be Miss Ann's house right here, um, and that would be a Carolina Power and Light substation in her backyard, folks. Okay, so she took Carolina Power and Light, now Duke Energy, to the state Supreme Court um, back in the 50s when they were buying out this, um, this block, basically, to put in this substation. And she did win the right to look on to a large substation for the rest of her life. Um, so her house still does exist. Um, and so at this point, the city kind of went back and we proposed three new designs, which was a total and utter waste of time. Um, and the project was basically scrapped because the city didn't want to spend the political capital to build this particular project, okay? Um, so the take home point here is get local buy-in before the effort of design is, is undertaken. And that seems quite obvious, right? All of us understand that. We, we, we have to do outreach and, and education up front and understand what the local homeowners want. Uh, we can't force things on people, okay? That said, I've been called a lot of things in my life. I am not a quitter, okay? I'm not a quitter. So I kept that intersection in the back of my head. And when we talked to Al, I said, huh, so you have what amounts basically to an underground, potentially an underground bioretention system in which a tree is going to grow out of it. You know, I bet Miss Ann might not hate that idea, right? All right. So I went back to Miss Ann, went back to her house, and I talked to her, and sure enough, she's like, so at the end of the day, when you construct this thing, I'm gonna see a nice tree cross from my house. And I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, I can buy into that. That sounds good, she was on board, right? So this brings me to one of the reasons why I really like using these underground suspended pavement systems, right? You've got this practice, it's underground. And so once it's built, once the construction's done, once that headache is over, um, the neighbors are really happy about it, right? Um, they're happy about that BMP. So in this case, these are the two silver cells that I'm gonna talk about that we uh, monitored. So there's one here on Ann Street, and here's Miss Ann's house, and one on Orange Street. And you can see they drained one block a piece of, um, of imperviousness from, from the, the adjacent block. Um, all right, so we're gonna go through a, a bit about what is suspended pavement. This is probably preaching to the choir, right? Um, I'm sure all of y'all know, um, all of y'all, wow. Okay, all right, anyway. Yeah. It's been, a lot of years. <laughs> it's been a long week, folks. It's been a long week. Okay, so with traditional planting, right, you, you've got a really highly urbanized environment here in New York City. You've got, right, we're just compacting the heck out of all the soil. 95% um, proctor compaction is the standard for everything. Um, so you can see you can grow basically a, a really crummy tree um, that doesn't have a big uh, DBH and, and a nice, uh, nice crown to it. Um, or you can use a suspended pavement and basically uh, use a nice tree planting media, which is you know, kept uncompacted by the fact that you have um, the, the silver cell basically providing the structure to the sidewalk above. So you know, these are your traditional street trees. I actually saw one on the way here just before we got on the subway. Um, a lot of them die, right? You see them cut off about three inches above the, uh, the pavement surface. Um, you know, they, they, the typical life expectancy, five years, maybe 10 if you're lucky, right? You're not gonna get a big tree out of these, uh, these systems. So you need to provide sufficient soil volume um, in order to get uh, an actual tree that's gonna provide you some of the ecosystem services that Bill talked about earlier. Um, and, and again, we need to have sufficient soil volume here to do so. I would say that if you're just putting these systems in for tree health, I'm, I'm all about trees, I love trees, okay? I do, I love trees. But I think you're missing the boat if you're just putting them in for tree health. I think we can also use these systems as I'm gonna talk about for water treatment, okay, for stormwater treatment. Um, you can absolutely route water into it um, and have the water go through another drain and tie into your existing sewer network. So this is an example, and cities across the country have gone to this. Um, Columbus, Ohio recently, so where I work, uh, recently went to a new streetscape standard where um, in downtown you have to plant um, each tree in 1,000 cubic feet of, of, of soil, basically, um, provide an uncompacted soil volume for that tree in order to grow um, and, and provide actual shade and benefits to, um, to the, the citizens of, of Columbus. 
Um, so this is an example of what it looks like, right? Um, again, I did not make this figure. I am an engineer. Um, so again, a nice landscape architecture figure here. Um, but you can see the suspended pavement here. It's providing the structure to um, the, the concrete, and then the, the trees obviously can then access that uncompacted soil volume um, and really, you know, really grow as they would in a forest. Um, all right, so some examples of, of, um, of demonstration sites have been put in. I just want to show you that the fact that the trees do, in fact, grow much larger. Um, so these two examples are going to be from Toronto. This is a demo site that was built in 2008. Um, so here it is going into construction. Um, this is the guts of the system. So we have um, kind of an intake catch basin, and this will be very similar to the site that we designed and built in Wilmington. So basically taking the, the water off the street. Um, you've got a distribution pipe, so the water goes into this distribution pipe. Um, it distributes around through this um, kind of curvilinear um, pipe there, um, and then filters through the soil media, um, which you can design any way you like, right? If you've got a target pollutant of interest in your particular watershed, be it phosphorus, you might put a particular absorbent in for phosphorus, or if you're really concerned about cadmium, you might put in a particular absorbent for cadmium, um, or bacteria, or the like. You can really design these any way you want for what pollutant you're, you're after. Um, got clean outs in case the tree were to get into the underdrains. You could go in with a rotor rooter or something similar and clean out those underdrains. And then you got tree pits. You got two tree pits there um, for the trees that are going to go in, as you'll see in just a second. So here it is about a couple years later, a year and a half later. You can see, okay, not that impressive. The trees are, are relatively small still. Um, four years later, getting larger, getting closer, maybe to about two stories tall. And then five years old, we're, we're well above two stories tall at that point. Okay. If you look at a standard street tree, um, you're lucky if they're eight feet tall at, at five years old, right? All right. And then one slide here showing a progression, um, again, up in Toronto over four years. And you can, I think that's really worth a thousand words. I mean, it just speaks volumes for, um, for what these uncompacted soil volumes can give you um, as far as tree health and tree growth. Okay. Last slide on proving that these things work. Um, this is down at Bartlett Tree Lab in, uh, in North Carolina, actually. Um, and we've got basically a silvicell system here on the left um, and a similar system that was planted with uh, structural soil uh, at exactly the same time, exactly the same trees. Um, and you can see the difference there in both the, the height and diameter of the trees as well as the general health of the trees. Um, obviously, you know, it doesn't take a genius to pick the one on the left, right? Um, so we just get a much better result from, uh, from these suspended pavement systems. All right. Okay. So what do we know about trees and stormwater? Because I'm, I'm a stormwater guy when it, when it comes down to it. That's what my job is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what we know is that uh, urban tree canopy cover can absolutely reduce stormwater runoff. Okay. So we have, um, in modeling scenarios, up to about 30% of stormwater in an urban environment can be interse intercepted if you have really good canopy cover, obviously, um, on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, and so maybe there's a happy marriage here. Maybe we can use these systems, as I mentioned earlier, for... Um, Stormwater treatment. So the need for these uncompacted soil volumes based on these um, tree health and tree health guidelines that are out there um, and the need for improved stormwater management based on the TMDLs that we have, the harmful algal blooms that we see in, in, in both North Carolina and Ohio um, with, you know, the, the HAB is closing down Toledo's water supply for about a week uh, three years ago. Um, and so I just want to give you this thought as well. Um, this is the standard bioretention media for the state of North Carolina here. Um, this is Proctor compaction here on the, the x-axis. So this is like compacted to smithereens. This is relatively loose here. Um, and we've got infiltration rate, right? This is the same soil. This is just a standard bioretention soil mix. Um, what you can see is when you don't have it compacted, you're up around eight or nine inches per hour. And when you've gone ahead and compacted it, you're down around one inch per hour. So what does that affect as far as our treatment filters? If you compact it, it means we can put less water through the soil, which means these filters have to get larger, right, in order to treat a certain volume of water, okay? So um, these suspended pavement systems help to keep us in these higher ranges of soil infiltration rate where we can reduce the size of these systems, which means we can reduce the cost to treat per gallon of stormwater, okay? So again, compaction affects the rate, um, infiltration rate of the soil, uh, which affects the size of the storm that can be treated by a particular device, um, like a bioswale, for instance. Um, and compacted soil also affects plant growth, tree health, all of those things. Um, so hopefully here we can show you that we have a good uh, combination. So I'm going to postulate to you that these things work very similarly to an underground bioretention system. Basically, it's a bioretention system that folks don't actually see from the surface. Um, so the silva cells here are providing the structure for your um, asphalt pavement above, your, basically your sidewalk typically above. 
um, and the stormwater is routed in in some way, shape, or form, and then an underdrain carries that uh, stormwater out to, um, that discharges that additional stormwater out to uh, the storm drain network. Okay, so what I'm trying to, to jam home here is that we really should be routing stormwater to street trees in order to get the maximum benefit out of these systems, right? Um, we should be using these systems as filters along with all the other benefits that street trees uh, provide. Okay, so here comes the research study. This is what we did in Wilmington. Um, we built, as I mentioned earlier, we sh I showed you the, the map from above. We built two nearly identical silva cell systems. Um, we wrapped them in an impermeable geomembrane. Basically, we built a giant burrito um, out of a pond liner. Um, to basically to keep water from infiltrating into the underlying soils. Wilmington is a coastal city. It's built basically on relic sand dunes. Um, and so if we hadn't built it as a giant burrito, as I'm going to show you, we wouldn't have ever gotten any outflow from the system and we wouldn't have been able to compare how dirty the water was coming off the road to how clean the water was coming out of this tree soil filter system that we had built. Okay? Um, we provided about 750 cubic feet of soil for uh, the tree growth and stormwater management. Um, we planted crepe myrtles, which was the city's decision. There are crepe myrtles literally everywhere um, in Wilmington, so that's what they wanted. That's what we went with. Not my favorite tree in the world, but um, it is what it is. Okay, so um, we were initially trying to look at two different soil media types. Uh, we had a standard bioretention media, which is a heavily sandy mix. Um, so 85 to 80% sand, 8 to 12% clay and silt, so your fine fraction. Um, and 3 to 5% organic matter by volume, which is a very low amount, right? That's about 1% by mass, okay? So very, very low um, organic matter in this media. And then kind of a more standard tree planting media, um, which again was very sandy, had some gravel in there, and then also had a lot more silt and clay than what we typically have in bioretention. Um, okay, uh, the drainage area properties really quick. We basically had a block draining to each of these, very similar, uh, directly connected impervious areas. Uh, the slope, Wilmington's a coastal city, so it's very low slope like it is here in New York City. And the underlying soil, again, was 95 to 98% sand, so really, really sandy underlying soils in this particular case. This is, I, I'm an engineer, so I have to show you a cross-section, of course. Um, this is our design cross-section for the system. Basically installed a new catch basin on the upslope side of the system to, to capture the water from the, uh, the gutter pan. Um, had a six-inch conveyance pipe to basically convey that water to the silver cells. Um, we then had the silver cells as the, the major portion of the, uh, of the system of the stormwater control measure. Um, we had an, a one foot, one foot upturned elbow in the underdrain, so we basically had a, um, an upturn in the, the PVC pipe here um, that caused an anaerobic layer to form in the bottom foot of media in the silver cell. And the design there was to try to drive denitrification um, and reduce the amount of nitrate uh, coming off of our streets since nitrogen is one of our uh, primary pollutants of concern in North Carolina. And then we connected that, exist, that, that new underdrain um, to the existing catch basin, the existing storm sewer network um, that existed at the corner. Okay, uh, another cross section, this is of the silva cells in particular. Um, so zooming in on that silva cell, uh, we had two six inch distribution pipes. Um, so we basically split the flow coming off of the, uh, the street. We then had th uh, three four inch underdrains in the bottom of the system. And this was filled with uh, the media, of course, and you can see the silver cells in here as well. Um, yeah, silver cells in frames of media, I just said that. Um, and then tree, we had a tree obviously planted uh, just adjacent to the street in the plaza area, and then the roots could, of course, grow out into uh, the silver cells themselves. So I'm going to show you the construction process. It's a relatively simple construction process. It's made a lot simpler when you have graduate student labor to do the work. It's pretty awesome. Okay, I would recommend you hire them if, uh, if you're a consulting firm. They're, they're cheap. Um, I was a grad student once, I can say that. All right, so um, we did work with the city of Wilmington Cruz as well. Um, they were fantastic help, so I want to thank them as well. Um, so you can see we basically cut out an existing sidewalk on this particular corner, on these particular two corners. We repeated this twice at, at Ann and Orange Streets. Basically dug a big swimming pool, um, so 36 feet long, 9 feet wide, and 4 foot depth. Compacted the underlying soils to get a nice base course for um, the system that we were going to build on top of these underlying soils. Then installed a bunch of liners, so we put a geotextile down first, then a pond liner down, and then another geotextile down to prevent the rock that we were going to bring in from puncturing that pond liner. Then um, put in a stone base, so um, had about, I think, six inches of stone that was put into the bottom of the system, uh, compacted that down with a plate compactor, and then brought in the frames. So um, these are the frames of the silver cells here. Um, they're about 18 inches high, um, and obviously they're you know, 90, 95% void space. So you can put whatever media you want in there, bioretention media that you have in your, in your locality. Um, 
So there's the first level of frames in. These are the, the three under drains going in. So these are perforated, of course, PVC um, that we zip tied to the frames. Um, we put in a little bit of gr more gravel to make sure the frames weren't shifting in there. Um, and then installed the first lift of media. So it came in with our standard, in this case, this is the standard North Carolina mix that was going in the ground. Um, and then continued with the backfill. So basically it was an alternating um, occurrence of basically filling around the system and compacting the soil on the outside while the burrito wrap was pushed to the inside. And then we'd move that out and put the next layer of media in and then repeat that process over and over again. Um, it's a relatively simple um, installation. Uh, and then finally, basically bringing the distribution pipes here. So these are the two distribution pipes that are come from, that bring water in from that new catch basin on the upslope end of this particular system. And then um, install the decks. So these are these snap to the top of these points on the frames. So there's six points on each frame and one deck snaps to each of those six um, legs. And the decks just help to spread out the loading so that you can get your HS20 loading that you need, obviously, for, um, for if you're gonna put this underneath a parking lot or the like. Um, and then we basically burrito wrap the whole thing, as I said. So we, we brought the pond liner together, glued it with the most, most caustic glue I've ever dealt with. I could certainly feel my jeans mutating while, while I was using it. It was awful stuff. Um, all right, so we, we burrito wrapped the whole thing. So again, keep that in mind as we, I'll, I'll bring that up as we look at some of the results. Um, and there's the, the finished system. There's the finished BMP, right? We have basically a new tree here a new catch basin here on the upslope end, so the water's coming in. This is our monitoring equipment here. And then the um, effluent from the system is routed to um, the existing catch basin at the corner. So again, the nice thing about these systems is from a, a you know, managing, from a human perspective, uh, it's very easy to sell someone a new tree, right? They, they're, they're happy to get on board with that. Um, and so all the filtration and all the good things that we like to talk about as stormwater engineers are happening underground um, instead of above ground. All right, the one thing that we got wrong in this study is the soils that we actually brought in were very, very similar. We were originally trying to look at two different types of soils. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit on this slide too hard, but basically um, the tree planting media that we tried to install, um, we ended up getting something that looked looking very similar to what our standard bioretention media was. So we essentially had a replicate instead of, um, instead of two different uh, types of media, which was unfortunate, but uh, that's life sometimes. All right, so the way we monitored the system, we had basically uh, on-site rain gauges, both manual and tipping bucket rain gauges to measure the Haida graph uh, at the site. We measured flow coming into and out of the system with weirs and pressure transducers, and then took samples throughout the storm event um, using ISCO samplers, which is kind of the um, standard operating procedure, best procedures, best practices for uh, stormwater monitoring. And then we sampled for a number of different constituents. We looked at sediment, um, a bunch of different nutrients, so both total and dissolved phosphorus, uh, total nitrogen, um, nitrate, so dissolved forms of nitrogen as well, and then three different metals, copper, lead, and zinc, which are the three most common that um, TMDLs are written for. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip quickly to the results here. Um, we basically had 700, as I mentioned earlier, we had 750 cubic feet of soil volume in this particular system. Half of that stayed saturated to the, due to that one foot upturned elbow in the under drain that I showed you earlier. Um, so we really only had 375 cubic feet of aerobic soil in the system. Um, and the remaining water-free pore space, assuming about a 33% porosity in the soil, was only about 125 cubic feet um, to store water. Um, and you can imagine 125 cubic feet of water coming off one entire city block that's not very much water at all. Um, so we didn't have a big effect on runoff volumes, as I'll show you here in just a second. So with this design, because it's burrito wrapped, this system primarily functioned as a flow-through filter. Um, so the runoff reduction was really negligible. We didn't see any, I'll show, you, I'll show you the data, prove it in just a second, but we didn't see any runoff reduction um, because of that impermeable liner. I think if we hadn't had that impermeable liner and we had soils that were underneath that were probably 30 inches per hour infiltration rate, um, we really would have seen probably 70, 80% runoff reduction at minimum. Um, so that liner had a, had a big uh, impact on the hydrology. This is just an example event. This is about a half an inch event um, that occurred back in, back in September of 2012. You can see the inflow hydrograph there in blue and the outflow hydrograph in red. So uh, we're definitely mitigating peak flow pretty substantially. Um, and in this, this particular storm event, we did have an effect on runoff volume. So we reduced about 30 cubic feet of stormwater um, coming up. We captured and stored and then evapotranspired about 30 cubic feet of stormwater coming off of that street, all right? Um, in terms of peak discharge, um, we did have an impact on peak discharge coming off of the street. 
Um, so we had a significant impact. In fact, about 62% on average decrease in peak discharge uh, coming off the street. The one challenge that we had was we did have a lot of bypass at the inlet, uh, the inlet catch basin, and I'll talk about why in just a second. So these would be for relatively small storm events, not for your 10 or your 25 year um, design storm. For runoff volume, again, because it was burrito wrapped and there was no connection to the underlying soil where we could expect some infiltration out the bottom, um, we really did not see any impact on runoff volumes. So um, N equals out on that case. If we look at it over the, the cumulative fate of runoff over the year of, of monitoring that we had, you can see that we had about 40 inches of rainfall, 32 of which actually ran off the, the street and the, the watershed as a, as a, as a larger hole. Um, we treated about 23 and a half inches of that stormwater. Um, so a pretty, pretty good amount. And then we had about 10 inches bypass the system. Um, the reason it was bypassing is because the catch basin at the upslope end of the system was becoming clogged typically with leaves and leaf litter and trash and debris as, as you might expect in a typical catch basin. So about 32% overall of the runoff bypassed the system. Uh, about two out of every five storms um, generated some amount of bypass um, in, in this particular case. Um, and so bypass was primarily linked to the pretreatment. So the pretreatment for these systems is really important as it is for bioswales and, and frankly for any practice, ponds, larger systems. Um, sediment accumulation and leaf litter, you can see this is the catch basin that we were working in on the upslope end and that's the catch basin there as well. Um, and so we just had leaves and other debris that got in there, clogged up um, the inlet pipe and so we, we just had water backing up basically and it would just continue down the curb line. Um, so having some sort of gross solids filter on the upslope end um, to, to get rid of that coarse woody debris and, and the trash and other uh, things in there is really, really imperative. Um, and this is really a challenge for any subsurface system. So um, it's not, not, just, um, not just these silica cell systems. Okay, in terms of water quality, this thing was a home run, folks. It absolutely was a home run for every single pollutant that we looked at. Um, the two streets are here, so Orange Street on the left, Ann Street on the right. Um, you see the percent removals there, so that's the difference between the inlet and the outlet concentrations. Um, so we had paired, paired uh, samples in all cases. And you can see that for nutrients in general, we're treating really well uh, both our sediment-bound nutrients, uh, total nitrogen, gosh, nitrate, we were up above 60% at one of the sites. Um, so we, this, this thing really just absolutely killed it. The effluent concentrations were um, at or below the best performing bioretention cells that we had in North Carolina that we've monitored, and we've been Bill's monitored a number of them at this point, um, probably seven, eight, nine, ten of them. Um, in terms of sediment bound pollutants, um, it removed about 90% of sediment, uh, and then you know metals tend to be uh, preferentially bound to sediment, and so we were up above 80% removal um, for all of the metals that we looked at as well. So this thing really, uh, in terms of water quality, was an absolute winner. Um, I'm just going to show you quickly some, some graphics here. These are actual storm events that were monitored for total nitrogen. So the inlet is in blue, the outlet is in red, um, and this is the ranked inlet concentrations and then the paired outlet concentration for each of those inlet concentrations. So this is the same storm event, okay? Um, and what you can see is that we're really reducing a lot of nitrogen in the system um, across both sites. Um, we had a, a study that was done years ago looking at ecological thresholds of effluent concentrations for stormwater BMPs and tying those to the health of benthic macroinvertebrates in streams in North Carolina. And what was found was a, a good nitrogen threshold was around 0.75 milligrams per liter, um, which is that black dashed line here in both cases. And you can see that our effluent concentrations in all but one case was well below uh, that good health threshold for benthic macroinvertebrates. All right. Um, same thing for total phosphorus, uh, just absolutely killed it. Um, we were, again, below that ecological threshold um, at Ann Street in every case and at Orange Street in about half of the cases. Um, so we, we really uh, had good performance both on a percent removal basis and also on the basis of the health of um, in-stream critters. Uh, dissolved phosphorus is one that's a challenge uh, to remove from stormwater, um, and it's a big cause of harmful algal blooms, so it's a big, uh, big one that we try to address in Ohio, uh, for instance. And again, you can see similar results where we're, uh, again, below the, the good health threshold for dissolved phosphorus um, in all cases in this particular study. Um, in terms of nitrate, we saw very similar results from the two, the, the, the two, the two streets. Uh, we had 0.05 milligram per liter effluent concentrations, which again is among the best um, that we've seen 
for bioretention. So for instance, um, back four or five years ago, uh, the latest bioretention study was actually uh, half again higher, 50% higher than, than this uh, Solvacel, uh, basically tree filter system that we studied here. All right, so the take-home points um, from the research end were uh, we did see a significant decrease in peak flow, 62% um, on average. We didn't see any impact on runoff volume, but I absolutely think that if you keep the system open and you don't line it, um, you could have significant impacts um, on, a, on a block scale on your runoff reduction. Um, water quality, this thing was fantastic. The filter worked excellent. Um, I think that the water quality may actually improve over time because we were looking at this system in the first year after construction and the trees were really quite small. Um, so that I think you could make the argument that after eight or 10 years when the trees have matured and become quite, quite large, your ET is gonna be pumped up and potentially the, the, um, some of the bacteria that live in the, the root zone, um, may, there may be many more of them and they may um, help the water quality end of things as well. So in terms of cost, everyone's always worried about cost, right? Um, the construction cost per system was about $15,000 to treat one block of um, stormwater runoff. Um, so we spent $30,000 in total. Um, it was about $53 a square foot if you're interested in the, the cost per square foot of the BMP surface area. Um, as a comparison, we typically somewhere, see somewhere between $10 and $15 per square foot by retention um, in North Carolina. Of course, it's going to be more costly if you build a system that's, that's underground. That's underground. Um, yep, gotcha. All right, um, in terms of design considerations and things you can take home uh, as designers, um, I think the imper impermeable liner may be atypical. The places obviously where you do want an, an impermeable liner are places like contaminated soils, brownfields, um, anywhere in your bound building foundations. Um, you probably want one adjacent to the road. Um, and then where infiltration and inflow is a major concern. So if you've got uh, leaky old sewers, which I imagine you do here, uh, you would want to do some uh, potentially do some dye testing and camera testing to make sure that you're not gonna just be putting that water straight from that tree filter into, um, for instance, your, seat, your uh, combined sewer. Um, maintaining a saturated layer within the system, um, we, it worked really well. In this case, we saw about 60% nitrate removal, which is phenomenal, um, but it may not always be the best case scenario, right? Trees, don't, trees are looking for oxygen, the roots are looking for oxygen, um, and so this, these anoxic conditions may not be ideal for the tree health side of things, so we need to take both sides of that coin into consideration when designing these systems. Pretreatment is the absolute most important thing, I think, for these systems, making sure that you have pretreatment to get rid of the gross solids, the trash, the debris, um, everything else coming off of the roadway um, to make sure that all of the water is actually going into your tree filter. Um, so some sort of trash guard, some sort of catch basin insert um, is critical to preventing bypass from the system. The other, uh, there's a couple other options that are out there. Um, you can use permeable pavement as your pretreatment. Um, this is not something I've done before, but I know the solar cell folks have done it uh, many, many times. Um, and so you're, of course, you're, if you're using permeable pavement, you're going to be removing all the trash and debris from the stormwater. Um, and you can just maintain it through routine street sweeping, so no, no real complex maintenance there. Um, I also was, was at dinner with Al last night, and um, we talked about the Denver design guidelines, so I thought I'd show you those as well, because I think they're pretty interesting. Um, City of Denver approves silver cells as a stormwater treatment device, so it's a stormwater BMP that's, that's in their approved list of BMPs. Uh, there's a number of other places that do as well, um, but I wanted to show you their design guidelines, because I think they're kind of slick. Um, the inlet pretreatment sump is actually on the right side of this graphic here. Um, so basically what they do is they have water come in off the... Um, off the road, there's some headspace here, and then there's basically a filter that's built out of number eight stone. So just standard ASTM number eight stone that you can get at any quarry across the United States. And that filters out all of your debris and litter and also a lot of your sediment out of the stormwater. And then basically the water is forced to pond up through the system by the outlet structure here, which is built um, out of an agri drain. Uh, an agri drain is a product basically where you can put boards in the drain here um, to allow the water to pond to whatever height you want it to, to store the water quality volume. And then there's an orifice down here in the bottom that allows the water to slowly drain out. In this case, their, their requirement is within 12 hours. Um, so it's a really slick design, I think, for, um, for these systems. So in summary, um, silver cells provide an uncompacted soil volume for street tree growth. And I hope they will also do so for stormwater management, right? I think there's absolutely dual benefits there. We can get more return on investment more ecosystem services out of these systems if we use both of those things rather than just for tree growth. Um, effective pretreatment, I've, hopefully I've beat that point to death. It's, it's really needed for every BMP, not just for this one. Um, and in terms of water quality, I think this system functions absolutely the same as traditional bioretention systems. Um, 
And so I, I, think it's, I think it's a win-win, right? I think it's an absolute marriage made in heaven. Okay, so some acknowledgments. The city of Wilmington was awesome to work with on the project. Um, their, their crews built the sites with us. Um, some of the graduate student labor um, was out there with us working, and then Deep Root and Kestrel Design Group for helping with uh, the design, and also Pat Greeley was out there during construction as well. Um, so I get, some, I get to spend some fun time in the field as an engineer, so that's me running a jumping jack compactor out there during construction. Um, do y'all, I guess, no questions, right? Okay. Questions. questions on the panel, okay. Well, thank you so much, appreciate it. <laughs>
focused on the hydrologic benefits of urban trees. And that, that's to say that they were able to quantify one or more of the tree's hydrologic cycle you know, components. So some numbers that we could actually take. So this is like the research that these guys are doing that we sort of start to pull out and go, okay, what does this mean when we start to develop a crediting system? Because what happens with these crediting systems, if you provide more credit for one type of practice versus another, guess what? Everybody shifts that way. So if we don't figure out how trees fit into that crediting system, then they're going to get lost, right? And we need to understand what is it that we're getting for this. So there's really not a whole lot of research out there, only 49 papers that we could come up with that really got us some solid numbers. But what we also did was we took a step back and we looked at non-urban forests as well to kind of understand what are the benefits we get from non-urban forests because that can sort of set an upper limit for our scale, right? We can understand that an undisturbed forest system or a fairly intact natural forest system is likely going to work better than a disturbed and um, compacted system that we'll see in an urban environment. So we looked at those natural systems as well to sort of say, okay, what, how far can we really take this in the urban setting? We don't want to overstate what urban trees can do, particularly when we look at what they're doing, you know, in a non in a non uh, urban setting, out in rural areas or in forested communities. So, really, what uh, we talked about sort of earlier was this stormwater BMP idea, where these are engineered systems. We can calculate things a lot better. We, there's drainage areas in. Uh, there's orifice diameters. We can look at where upturned elbows are. We can calculate storage. There's a lot we can do with stormwater BMPs. Well, urban tree canopy is a lot different. It doesn't really necessarily have a drainage area per se. Uh, the water quality benefits are, are kind of inferred from runoff reduction. It's hard for us to measure uh, a lot of the effects of a tree. Trees are, var are variable. Uh, what the tree is doing uh, in year one of its life versus year 10 of its life is going to be different. What the tree is doing in January is going to be different from what it's doing in April. So they're variable. And the other thing that's interesting about trees is the benefits increase with time, right? Trees get bigger. They have more ability to produce photosynthesis. They can bind up more carbon. As they grow, they get better. Um, but we also recognize that they're in these urban conditions. Uh, we saw a lot about particulate matter, uh, the, the, the stormwater going to them, maybe more polluted, may contain metals or toxics, so we're, de we're dealing with urban conditions. We talked a little bit about some of the maintenance concerns that come with trees, uh, pruning, uh, making sure that leaves are not clogging um, inlets, There's, so there are some maintenance concerns with trees in the urban environment that we don't necessarily have in, uh, in the rural areas. And then as a result, there's sort of a lack of incentives to use them for a credit, a stormwater credit. So you might use them for landscaping or some other reason, but to use just a tree as a stormwater credit is, is not always very easy or available. Uh, so what we wanted to do was really take a step back and look at what are the characteristics, what are the features of trees that really impact the hydrologic cycle. Because really what we're looking at here is runoff reduction. So we have the tree's ability to intercept uh, rainwater. So rain falls, some of it is intercepted by the trees, uh, leaves, and in some cases may evapor tra uh, evaporate or transpirate through that tree process. Some of it uh, goes down through the tree as stem flow. If anybody, and if anybody's a forester like myself, you've probably been caught in a horrible, god-awful rain event on some mountain somewhere at some point in your career. And I remember uh, being in the middle of nowhere, uh, and I knew, getting out of my truck, that it didn't look so good out there. But I figured, I, you know, I, I think I had, I had to get field work done. So off I went. I got about halfway up the hill, and it just unleashed on me. And I was standing underneath a, a, an American beech tree and just watching the water just pour down the stem. I mean, it was amazing the amount of water that was just clinging to the stem and just going straight into the ground. And you could almost see how maybe that beech's bark like evolved, that it really was very effective at pulling that water in and driving it into the ground. So just that tree stem's presence really provides a direct injection point for, for, uh, for water, for rainfall. And then we also have throughfall. So that water that doesn't get hung up 
in the leaves that does make it down eventually to uh, to the pavement or to whatever understory you have. And I'm sure many of you have seen come outside, it's maybe been a light rainfall, the pavement is wet around but not underneath the tree. So in that case, the rain event was so slight that there was very little through fall and most of it was intercepted. And then we get some infiltration and this can vary from site to site. If we have an engineered system, maybe fantastic. If it's in some poor little tree pit uh, out in front of the train station, you know, we're probably not gonna get a lot of infiltration. But these are the mechanisms which are going to allow us to understand, okay, what is it that these individual trees are doing to reduce runoff, which again is where we're picking up the pollutants, which is contributing to uh, stream bank erosion, which is carrying uh, additional nutrients off. So we really started to develop and look more closely at this uh, water balance approach, where really we're looking at inputs in, in the form of, of rain, uh, and then what are our outputs, and what is controlling those outputs. Uh, so we have obviously our evapotranspiration, and we have runoff, but then we also get some storage and, and infiltration. So really what we're looking at is the ability of an urban tree to reduce runoff is determined by how much it can intercept water and how much it can, uh, and then evapotranspirate some of that and how much of it can it get into the soil. So that's really what we wanted to, to really zero in on the research associated with, with those particular characteristics. Um, and so at first you kind of have to take a step back and go, okay, well, what are these, these processes are, are fairly well known um, to some degree. I mean, there's a lot of research out there, but how the tree does that is extremely variable. So take this photo, for instance, of a tree I took this past weekend as I was out mountain biking. This is, tree is in leaf fall, right? So the, what the surface, how this tree is reacting to something like interception right now is probably a little different than it was just a couple months ago, and is certainly gonna be different than in a couple months from now. So if you think about how this tree interacts just with interception alone, there's one characteristic. If the rainfall is very heavy, right, a lot of that rainfall is gonna make it through. So you're gonna get a less interception in the canopy. If the rainfall is really long, that's gonna contribute to more. Or if it's a less or, or, or a more frequent rainfall, you might get more uh, coming through. Uh, the leaf area, so the actual characteristics of individual trees, if it's a big leaf area versus a small leaf area, the leaf angle, the leaf surface, met, uh, factors like is it windy that day or what's the barometric pressure, all of these things can affect an individual tree's ability to affect runoff at any given point in time and in, every, in, any, in any site. So there is a tremendous amount of variability, but with that said, there is some research out there that we can look to um, and again, is what we pulled out of, of, of some of this. So when we look at the research, uh, again, there's it's kind of all over the map as to what species they picked and where it was done. Some of it was <coughs> measured, some of it was modeled. But when we look at uh, the breakdown, really we're looking at, you know, around six and a half to 27% 20 uh, interception for uh, deciduous trees in the urban environment. Um, and we jumped that number up a bit to 27, 66% for evergreen trees, which makes sense, right? Those trees have leaves on year round, so they're gonna have a longer time, a longer season to be able to actually intercept rainwater and have a better ability to evapotranspire it. So it's generally accepted or agreed upon that evergreen trees intercept more rainwater than deciduous trees, but you can see we're really kind of in that, you know, 27% range as to what we're actually getting in interception and in measured uh, studies um, across the country. And when we look at evapotranspiration, this one's even more difficult to really uh, figure out what's evaporating versus transpiration is often happens, it's happening simultaneously um, and figuring out which one is which is, is very, very difficult. Um, and so there's, there really wasn't any studies we found that quantified annual ET exactly. Instead, what most of the studies did was they evaluated one or more factors that influence evapotranspiration. Um, so that might be, you know, factors like rainfall interception or total leaf surface area, uh, the available water capacity and transpiration rates in, in our, um, of urban trees. And as you can see, again, uh, all over the map in terms of where these studies uh, have taken place. Uh, you'll note obviously in locations where you have longer growing seasons like uh, China or Los Angeles, 
uh, you're able to evapotranspirate more, right, which would be expected in some place like Minnesota where the growing season is, is much shorter. Uh, but you can see in general we're about 1, 0.1 to 2.39 millimeters per day for urban trees, which is actually pretty close to what we were seeing in undisturbed, uh, undisturbed conditions. So um, we can then kind of take this a little bit further and start looking at the infiltration of these trees. And I think this is really where there were some, some studies that more directly quantified the effect of urban trees on, on infiltration rates. And particularly Barton's looked at this uh, in some controls that he did where he had uh, trees planted um, in, in soil and tree pit areas uh, and then unplanted areas. So he's able to look at infiltration rates across those two areas and the Surprisingly, the ones with the trees had a 63% increase in infiltration. So obviously the tree is having a dramatic effect on the ability for the water to enter into the ground. Uh, and even more amazing, in my opinion, is the 153% for severely compacted soils. I mean, the, to think that a tree can grow in some of those areas alone is, is pretty amazing, but their ability to get in there, and if they can, push their roots through that soil, they can really, uh, they've really been able to demonstrate their ability to help rehabilitate that soil and to bring it back to the point where we're getting some infiltration by creating those little micro pathways using, you know, with their roots. And this sort of ties in a bit with what Ryan was talking about with the structural soils, with the CU soils. They looked a bit at, okay, what if we grow a green ash tree, which I'll be amazed to see how those trees are doing now. Most of the ash in my area aren't uh, doing so well anymore. Um, pretty, pretty sad uh, situation there. But uh, needless to say, in this case, he was looking at uh, green ash uh, and structural soils and showed that if you have a tree in those structural soils, you're going to increase infiltration rates by about 27 times. That's pretty dramatic. And so when you're thinking about these subsurface um, you know, systems, like Ryan showed, you know, just by sticking a tree in there, and it's in, and from your from Miss Ann's point of view, she didn't even mind that the tree was there. That was great. You're dramatically improving your your facility there. So even if you're just trying to use the soil and the plumbing to deal with runoff reduction, uh, that tree alone on the surface may provide, in addition to all the other benefits we all appreciate of trees, uh, some ability to improve the effectiveness of those structural soils. And again, the other thing that, we, that was interesting was another study looked at these uh, biofilters and trees' ability to affect uh, hydraulic conductivity in those biofilters. And they found that over time, both vegetated and unvegetated biofilters had a decrease in hydrologic conductivity. Uh, but the ones with trees increased. So, it, was the tree, it wasn't just vegetation, it was the trees that was providing uh, that additional benefit as time went on. And that, uh, the authors attributed to uh, the root growth, essentially the roots growing, uh, expanding, and creating larger and larger uh, pore spaces and pathways for water to, to infiltrate. Uh, and there was another study, it was a non-urban study, but it also looked at infiltration rates. And this one was interesting because it looked at what was the infiltration rate of a tree uh, under the canopy and then just outside of the canopy. So what is the impact of that tree just in that, in that sort of drip line? And in that study, it showed that the, that the infiltration rates were 50% uh, higher than outside of the tree canopy. So just that tree canopy alone uh, is really helping to impact that infiltration. Uh, so this really starts to drive us a little bit further into the thought of, of runoff reduction. So it's sort of taking it all together and going, okay, well, how does a tree really reduce runoff? And we talked a little bit about this with sort of interception and evaporation, evapotranspiration plus the improved infiltration equals uh, reduced runoff. So how are these combining? And most of the studies that we reviewed on this uh, used models. Um, they model all this using hydro hydrologic models, in particular with urban trees. The benefits <coughs> of the trees are usually seen right during the storm and just after. So they like to use continual simulation models to be able to really get at this. 
Um, and the most commonly used models that we found was American for City Green software, which is a TR55 based model, uses uh, typical curve numbers. So those numbers are altered based on the land use uh, characteristics uh, found in that area. Trees have one. Um, there's, you know, pavement and turf and all that. The other one is the U.S. Forest Service's iTree. How many people use iTree here? Anybody? Okay, so iTree is a, um, you know, very large and powerful uh, program, a little uh, onerous to use, uh, but it uses this hydrodynamic uh, canopy uh, model. And again, you can see uh, there were some pretty <coughs> wide-ranging uh, results uh, in this uh, study, uh, but overall there is a dramatic uh, decrease in, in uh, runoff from trees. And it depends on how you're looking at it. If you're looking at it from a, a larger watershed scale or an individual scale where those uh, reductions are occurring but and maybe where and how that tree is located. So you can see, for instance, in Page, he, he found that there was an 80% uh, additional runoff reduction, uh, but that was in a silva cell with a tree. So obviously that's an engineered system designed to help with runoff reduction, uh, whereas Sanders, you know, found 7% increase in runoff when you're really just looking at what is the change in urban canopy from one to another. So if we lose 22% of our urban tree canopy, he's, he was able to show that there was increase in runoff. So clearly as we, uh, as we in, in put trees in, either in engineered systems or put them in to just uh, in ecosystems or take them out, we are impacting the amount of runoff occurring on a site. And this is, again, without necessarily having an engineer, just the presence or absence of those trees. Uh, so I don't know if any of you guys are getting excited about December and the new Star Wars coming out. I, I also grew up in the 80s and 90s, so I'm a big Star Wars fan. So, so when I was thinking about this presentation, I was like, you know, <coughs> trees are no good dead. And the first thing I thought of was, Good old Boba Fett going after uh, Han Solo. Um, and so really, I think when you start to think about uh, runoff reduction and tree growth, you start to really go, well, geez, this is kind of all the same as tree health, right? I mean, we want to promote um, crown spread. We want to promote uh, the ability for trees to have root growth. Um, so they, we're sort of in the same boat here. So healthy trees sort of equals good water quality. And the great thing about this is we can sort of learn. We can look at how our designs have occurred over time, both in deliberate application of trees for stormwater and passive. We just put a tree there. What was its result? Uh, we can look at their installation techniques and methods. And we can also look at how we're managing those systems to understand what is it we can do differently moving forward uh, to help improve the tree's ability to essentially capture water and improve infiltration rates. So we need the trees to be alive to do that. And so really we can start to look a little bit at what is it that helps the tree out and where is the cross section with water quality. And what you quickly come to is really uh, planting area and soil volume, right? Um, that is the most commonly cited factor affecting tree growth and survival. We already saw a bunch of great photos that showed year after year after year of trees that essentially have excellent opportunity to grow, have a lot of uh, available soil volume, and trees with even just slightly less. And it's a dramatic difference. And as, we, as I showed, really what we're talking about is how much crown spread do we have, how much rooting volume do we have, how easy is it for that water to get into that. Ground. That's, that's what the tree is doing for us. It's helping us to capture some of it and shoot some of it into the ground. And so we need the soil volume uh, to do that. And again, there were a number of studies that looked specifically at this. Uh, some of them in Milwaukee looked at trees that had lots of space to grow and trees that had no space to grow. And as you might expect, those trees that had lots of space to grow uh, were more likely to survive. And as space decreased, uh, those trees got more stressed and were more likely to decline or, or not make it. Um, when we looked at trees in parking lots, um, there was a direct correlation to the, the amount of tree volume and the tree size. So if when you're surrounding those trees with pavement, as you'd expect, 
the amount of space you give that tree to grow is really what dictates how big it's going to get. And again, when they just did another survey uh, just down the road in, in, in New Jersey, uh, looking at the survival of, uh, of trees there, and they, were, they showed there that uh, as the amount of soil grew, or the amount of space that the tree had, soil space grew, the larger the trees became. And then those trees that didn't have a lot of soil space, uh, they got a lot smaller, didn't grow at all. Uh, I'm not going to get into this too much because I just heard a whole lot about this. But engineered soils is obviously a technique that people are really looking at now as we look at our street trees and trying to understand how is it that we can provide the soil volume in these very, very tight settings. So we have a situation where property values are extremely high, like in here in New York City or in Washington, D.C. Uh, you don't have a lot of space for surface treatments. It's all underground or on the roof or in other spaces. So utilizing these engineered soils uh, to support uh, paved areas or other things so we still provide um, space, rooting depth, rooting area for those trees to grow is really, uh, really uh, a key feature, key design feature, not just for tree health, as Ryan indicated, but this is really where the stormwater comes in. So we're providing all of that volume now underneath that sidewalk or underneath part of the parking lot uh, to allow for tree growth, to allow for infiltration, and to allow for storage. And at the same time, providing the resources necessary for the tree canopy to grow which is also providing additional uh, transpiration, interception, um, uh, you know, abilities. So, uh, so really, this use of engineered soil media has really helped. And then when we look again at, at trees grown um, in these soils, these engineered soils, these structural soils, they, they grow much, much faster than trees in normal, just cut out pavement tree boxes. So we know that uh, engineered soils support tree growth. We know that it supports, we just heard uh, these, these, these types of systems support nutrient reduction. So it's sort of a no-brainer to really look at these, uh, the amount of soil that we're requiring in these tree pits to really help dictate what is it that we're getting for this tree, right? If we have a tree that's in a teeny tiny little box and isn't going to live but five years and isn't going to grow very much, we're not getting as much out of that tree as we would say a tree that was grown in uh, you know, 1,500 uh, cubic foot uh, box or in an engineered system uh, that had supported pavements. And these are some uh, soil recommendations uh, that, and they're, they kind of run the gamut from very <coughs> complex that sort of base it off of the height of the tree or the diameter or the crown. And those are all wonderful. And sometimes you have to expect, you have to predict, okay, this tree is gonna get this big, so I need this much space. And those are wonderful. And then you have some more basic ones where it's a 1,500 cubic feet or you know, 400 cubic feet. So, um, but the key is really the more soil volume we have, the more we have for root growth, the more we have for water storage, uh, the more ability the tree is going to have to grow, uh, grow larger. So 1,500 cubic uh, feet seems to be about the sweet spot I see in a lot of, uh, a lot of journals, a lot of articles. Uh, but again, there's a different ways of looking at it and different, different approaches. But I think that that 1,500 cubic feet, at least from what I have seen, has started to bleed into these credit methodologies and these credit approaches and how how this all works. And so I'll just cover a few of these now um, and talk a bit about my thoughts and maybe provide a little bit of uh, perspective on the Chesapeake Bay Program's uh, model as well. So there's a couple different ways that communities across the country have been looking at, in, at urban trees and how can you credit a tree, like an individual tree. Again, this is not an engineered system. This isn't a, I built this, you know, uh, biomedia with this catch basin here that catches, you know, this many acres and we get this much volume. This is just, I'm going to put a tree on my site. What credit am I going to get? Um, and so there's a couple different ways that we see this. One is an impervious cover credit. So you put a tree out there and you get some sort of credit off of your impervious area. So let's say 
you're in, you're in Sacramento in this case, depending on the type of tree you implement, you can basically knock off 200 uh, square feet of impervious area off of your calculation. So you add some trees in there, you can start to reduce the amount of impervious area that generates the, the coefficients for the runoff that dictate the size of your facility. So you might be able to shrink your facility some by using some trees. Again, Seattle's very similar, different rain patterns in these jurisdictions, so they take different approaches. But the one that I find most interesting is the volume approach. Uh, because I think this gets a little bit more at the re what's really going on here, which is the storage and treatment of that water. And so Georgia has one where they look at the diameter of the trees and they give you a certain number of gallons uh, off of your, you know, your, your requirement per tree. Um, the one I'll get to in just a second here is Washington, D.C.'s, which I'm most familiar with. Our, uh, the center does some uh, stormwater plan review for the district, so we get to see a whole lot of very cool uh, stormwater plans for, like, and, you know, all kinds of interesting buildings down there. And so I have some cool, uh, or a good example of this. But in D.C., they have a, a credit based on uh, volume. So essentially, depending on um, the, uh, the size of the, the tree, whether it's an existing tree or a newly planted tree, you'll get a credit. And I will get into this uh, a little bit further as we go. And then there's the Minnesota credit, which I, I don't know a tremendous amount about. But uh, it is uh, the most involved. It gets into a whole bunch of different factors uh, that try to get at the evapotranspiration rate and looks a lot at the soil volume. So Minnesota's is definitely the most robust of all of them. Um, and then we have what I'd like to talk just real briefly about is the Chesapeake Bay Programs um, version of this. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the Chesapeake Bay watershed, we have this wonderful, gigantic TMDL, which keeps people like me employed, uh, running around to, trying to figure out how in the world we're actually going to get this done. And it's a gigantic, you know, multi-state effort. And so they've had to come up with these uh, rules, essentially, that all of the states have to abide by. And so even though you have these local regulations, which might derive your individual project, so you're going to go and apply for a permit to build whatever building, and then you have these requirements to meet, that's one thing. And those, All that information, all those stormwater practices that are developed get funneled into a database, which then gets sent to uh, essentially the federal government, and they tally it in their own way. So it doesn't really even matter at the end of the day for, for the TMDL what the locals do. At the end of the day, all this information is going to be pushed up to EPA, and they're going to shove it through this model. And the model um, is huge, and it has evolved pretty dramatically over the years, and we're just entering phase six of the model. Ooh. Is anybody familiar with the Chesapeake Bay model? Anybody? Okay, a couple of people. So phase six is really exciting because it totally takes the card table and it's just like knocks all the tick cards off. It's like, okay, pick them back up and see where you sit. Um, so they've really done some dramatic things in, in the phase six model. And if you haven't had a chance to dig into it, if you're a model geek, uh, it's, it's pretty cool what they've done. But I'll stick to just trees. If you're interested in stream stuff, it gets really interesting how they're doing there. But for trees, what they did was they added entire new land cover groups. They're actually calling them source load sectors now because stream, streams and stream banks and, or stream bank and bed and floodplain are now a load, essentially a land use, but it's not a land use, so they call them source sector loads now. It's all fancy new jargon. Um, but anyway, the, the point is they've added new land uses in. And one of the, or several of the new land uses is involved tree canopy. It's very interesting. They have various impervious surface categories, like impervious road, impervious non-road, and impervious roof. And then now they have tree canopy over each of those. So essentially what the tree canopy does is just proportionally lower the load underneath that tree canopy, which is pretty interesting uh, when you start to think about it from a, uh, a larger watershed scale, and you start to think about what impact a 40% tree cover goal would have on a TMDL. Like before, that was sort of off to the side. Like I had this tree canopy goal, and I know it's important, and I like the idea of it, but how do I 
get credit for it in my TMDL, which is costing me an amazing amount of money to try to meet. And so this uh, actually helps to provide uh, some of that um, by providing a credit for essentially reduction in load for that impervious surface or roof or, or turf grass that's just below the canopy. So a very interesting way of doing it um, and I think is a way that you'll see these larger uh, uh, TMDLs evolve. So, I mean, we, there's been a ridiculous number of lawsuits in the Chesapeake Bay region by the Farm Bureau in Iowa. You know why that is? Because they know that the Chesapeake Bay is a testing ground for the much larger uh, TMDL that's going to be hitting in Mississippi. So they, the, the farm groups have been all over uh, EPA in our region, even though what does Iowa have to do with, with Maryland or Pennsylvania? But they know it's coming, and this is likely the testing ground. So this is how these things are going to show up as these TMDLs roll out down the, down the line. Uh, but I'm just going to break this down more specifically to Washington, D.C. Like I said, I'm, I'm uh, familiar with D.C. Uh, these stormwater regulations have been recently written, so it takes into consideration some of the latest and greatest. So in D.C., there's a preserved tree credit and there's a planted tree credit. If you preserve a tree on site, you get 20 cubic feet of stormwater treatment volume uh, for that tree. The tree must be in your limit of disturbance, so you can't pick a tree over there and go, oh, I'm going to take credit for that. It's got to be something that you're actually preserving and working around. One of the things I think is very interesting from a tree guy, uh, not that I don't like my engineering friends, but this one actually requires a tree uh, professional to come out and say, yep, that tree looks good and it's going to survive. Um, and the tree must have a 35-foot canopy. Uh, the planted tree credit is about 10 cubic feet for stormwater credit. It's got, it can be outside. The LOD can be in the right of way. Uh, has about 35 foot spread. Um, all trees in planted must have 1,500 cubic feet of planting soil. And then if they're in a shared pit, they have a thousand. They must have a thousand. So if you have two trees, you can do 2,000 cubic feet. So here's an example, one that came in recently. You can see the trees are are clearly labeled, um, marked. They have permit numbers. They identify the trees. They identify how much soil volume they have, how that was measured. You can see there. Uh, this is an example. This one implemented something very similar to what Brian was showing with the structural soils, essentially a tree pit with had access to structural soils nearby. Uh, this shows their, their equations. You can see they are able in their narrative to demonstrate they get about four, uh, 140 cubic feet of treatment. They're also getting a bit more, 790 cubic feet from their bioretention system. So again, they're able to actually do this. They did preserve a tree on this site. This is right out of their plan set, so they actually include a letter in there from the arborist saying that this tree is healthy, gives you some ideas on how to keep it healthy. So sort of moving towards wrapping this up, what we've been doing is taking all this information and putting it into this uh, making urban tree trees count framework. Uh, and that's really, again, to provide the scientific basis uh, for encouraging the use of trees to meet stormwater regulations. and. So this is a national tool, so it takes into consideration uh, location and, and has some regulatory context and, and delves a little bit into the stormwater currency crediting. I don't want to get too far into this. This is a whole presentation unto itself. But basically, it applies two different types of credits depending on how you're looking at this. Either an annual pollutant load reduction credit for trees, for tree planting. This would be like a TMDL setting where you're changing current conditions to something different. What is the benefit I get pre and post? And the other one is a more of a performance-based credit system on an event or a design storm basis. So it depends on how you're implementing this, whether it's a state credit system or a TMDL system. But it basically takes all the information that we um, uh, found in our studies uh, and the modeling work that we did to, to put it into a nice, easy tool, spreadsheet, calculator tool. If anybody's familiar with the center, we love Excel. Uh, we have some people that are it does amazing things with Excel I never even knew. I'm sure I got, was taught it at some point, but I didn't retain it. But anyway, we again have resorted to our uh, lovely Excel. Also makes it very easy for you guys to use this open source. Obviously, we paid for it by the by the government, so we want people to use it. Uh, calculates credits on an annual basis. Looks at land use loading rates with and without trees. Provides relative runoff. Uh, reductions. Also looks at, again, for us in the Bay Region, we're very interested in nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, so it looks up that. And then it's got all these great lookup tables 
uh, based on the water uh, balance. And uh, we were able to do some improvements in some of the modeling out there. Uh, I won't get too in depth in this, but really what we did was we took like the SWAT model and we kind of added onto it. And we looked a bit at some of the infiltration rates and at the zones in which the soil can actual, or the tree can actually access uh, that water and uh, the leaching rates of soil, of water in various different soil types. So you can really tailor your site based on what your characteristics are and get as good a representation as we can model on, on, uh, on that particular site. Uh, so it really is a process-driven approach that really pulls from the numerics and I think is the next step, if you will, in, in modeling at least these sort of individual trees or, or small clusters of trees. Um, and so this really brings me to what uh, uh, my favorite thing to talk about is what's the next thing we're working on? I was always a distracted kid. And it, you know, it was like you, you start like a model or something and you get about halfway done and you're already looking at the next one you want to buy. Um, and, and that's still me to this day. So looking ahead at some of the things that we're thinking about doing and, and currently working on is more of direct measurement of tree performance. This is really difficult to do, um, an individual tree. And what is an individual urban tree? I mean, what, what does that really mean? And so we're really starting to break this down into, well, an urban tree is a tree in your yard, right? But an urban tree also might be a cluster of trees in your yard or maybe between your yards. or Maybe it's a small cluster of trees with understore, with, a, with a, a developed leaf litter, which we know has its own impacts. So, but it's not a forest. It's not like an acre. You know, nobody's going to go out there and cruise it and go, yep, you got you know, 1,500 cubic feet of volume you can cut out of here. Now, these are little tiny patches. And so each of those probably acts differently and provides different benefits. And so what we're really looking at is working with the University of Maryland to collect field data to develop this sort of more refined tree water balance. And so they're installing lysimeters and rain gauges and sap flow measurements. And it is going to be hopefully really cool uh, to see this process. They're looking at red maple and I think elm or another tree they, they were going back and forth on. Definitely red maple was, was one of the main ones. We've got our sites set up and it'll be three years of research on that. In conjunction with that, uh, and sort of together, dovetailed, is our friends down at Virginia Tech who are looking at this urban forest typology. So what is, so let's understand what is the urban forest, right? So when I grew up in forestry, we had like uh, forest types. Like I go and I could measure, if I knew there was a certain number of this type of trees, if this was a, a beech oak forest, and I could look at a table and it provide all the characteristics of that type of forest, where it grows, the, you know, all, all kinds, of, that does not exist in the urban forestry arena. We don't have that same thing. We, we sort of piece it together, but how these trees are, where they're structured, where they're located in the landscape is all gonna impact how they function. And so being able to understand, okay, what is this individual tree doing, right? Or this cluster of trees, how are they functioning? And then taking that and going, okay, let's take a step back. Now, where is this located? How is this distributed across the landscape? Where do we expect these services to be provided? And then how do we then move forward and go, Oh, how do we manage for that? How do we protect that? How do we incentivize those areas to remain on the, 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 the landscape? And then my last thing, this is an area where some of my forestry friends uh, get down on me when I start talking about leaf litter. And you actually had a great example of leaf litter, clogging up an inlet. And so leaves have nutrients in them, you know, just so you know. So those leaves in the, in the natural environment would fall on the ground and probably decompose and not go very far. But in the urban environment, they're falling on probably pavement or maybe turf grass and being blown long distances or being transported long distances by stormwater and then sitting in a catch basin and essentially acting like a giant tea bag, leaching out nutrients. So we have to understand that urban trees, there's a give and take there. And it's a little bit different than a, a natural setting. And so we need to understand, okay, what, if we're doing all this work with the trees and then we're shedding the leaves, what does that mean for us? What is the nutrient content of that? And then how do we manage for that? Do we manage it through street sweeping? Do we manage it through catch basin, uh, catch bags? Uh, what is it that we need to do to manage for that? And so under, a little bit more understanding what is in that leaf litter 
um, and understanding how we predict the nutrient loads from that is really what's on our screen. And we've been doing some of that work. I've been sifting through bags of completely disgusting, nasty leaves that's been pulled literally out of a catch basin bag and identifying them by species. So you know you're good at your tree when you can take a fraction of a leaf and identify it, um, or a piece of, a, of a, a needle. But that's really what we're interested in as well. And uh, just imparting, we do have our, an, our, our annual conference coming up, a national conference in April. Uh, it's a wonderful event. If you can make it down to Baltimore, we'd love to see you. But if not, it's also online. Uh, so check us out. All kinds of great uh, information on stormwater uh, and the latest and greatest. So hope to uh, see you there. And if you can join us in Baltimore, we'd love to have you. That's all I have. Thank you. We uh, let them go a little over, but we have about 10-minute break. So there's some refreshments outside, and then we'll call you back in.